I don't know if you saw my vestiges of war. It's the culmination of um, several different components that fanned out over um, several years, and the Philippine American War was the historical departure point. And then it went all the way forward into like postmodern. Like, how can you put someone like Ben Cab, whose early work was dealing with the Philippine American War? next to somebody like Paul Pfeiffer's work, which is much more abstract and conceptually based, looking at the effects of colonialism. You have to leap your mind forward, right? So that project actually got me started on all of these different types of projects where it was me like translating all the things that I do with my life. So from being a video maker, you know, photography, teaching, cultural organizing and realizing that I don't need, I can't express myself in any one way and also I've been very fortunate to meet so many people. I mean, since I first met you, I pretty much spent the last 30 years back and forth here and meeting, going out into the provinces and meeting a lot of different kinds of people and realizing that there's a phenomenal amount of talent and diversity. And not to say that New York doesn't have it, but it doesn't mean the same thing to me. And so, you know, despite the fact that I still speak the language really shitty, um, I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> uh, Has there been a big difference uh, uh, in, in terms of um, ideas? Oh God, yeah. I mean, since '85. Mm -hmm. Like, I just found this photograph. He didn't come with us, but Sid came with me, and he took me to Smoky Mountain. And, yeah, I, and I mean, that basically started what I call the Philippine series of my video. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult because, you know, I went to a very elite art school. I mean, when I first met Marcel, we were talking about a lot of issues in the early days of postmodernism. And, and Arts Network Asia here in, in, in Asia. Um, one of the projects I did, like, so I would get funding for the artists that I worked with. So like in Singapore, uh, I brought in, uh, I did one project um, in the Visayas. And um, the funding came from multiple sources. So at that time I was still teaching at um, NYU, so seed money came from them. And then I got funding from the Jerome, uh, the Ford Foundation Jakarta, Singapore Arts Council, different, yeah. right, the NCCA. Um, what about the NEA? Because the NEA, they, they changed right after, in 93, when all these artists were censored, and they lost all their funding. So the NEA, forget it. And my work at the beginning was dealing a lot with looking at how Catholicism, religion, institutionalized religion, affected um, cultural and national identity and all this stuff. And so nobody would, I can't air that stuff. I'm very critical of the Catholic Church and all institutionalized, all forms of institutionalized anything. And they're not going to air that on national, I mean, even the most left of left of totally so-called progressive people will not touch this work. CBC, CBC, This work ruffled many feathers. <laughs> this piece nailed, I mean, and I did, it, and it's fascinating because there's a double standard. But you have to see the work, the way I make the work. This is non-traditional. You know, I've got a guy performing in underwear coming out of a mound of dirt like Lazarus, and then he is acting like a human beast of burden, and he's plowing with his feet, and then I cut to like an, a super imposition of him over Edsa with the with the Amelda's like workers. You know, there's a lot of stuff in it that people would just they were horrified. It's totally the abject. Uh, no, and piece. you know, I mean, I don't have any bad feelings about it. I mean, mm. I, it, what, what it, it helped me to understand is, um, um, 
you know, just the double standards of you know, uh, what people fear when it comes to religion. But, but you're saying it's really more the manner of your discourse that people would be uncomfortable with more than with the topic. I think so. I mean, it was interesting because, unfortunately, I wasn't in the country when it, so the Harvard um, School of Theology wanted to screen this one piece called Nailed. And I was so shocked, and I really wished that I could have been there. And they wrote me a letter back saying, here we are, we're theologians, we're scholars, and we never thought to look at religion from a colonial perspective or a post-colonial perspective to see how the church functioned and con continues to function. And it was this great letter, you know, and, and they said, you really made us have to think more about what we're doing and what is the study. You know, radical theologians will look at this, but your, you know, everyday uh, priest or clergy won't necessarily, you know, because, and I mean, my, my work has kind of, I, I hope, grown and changed since then. But what happened to me was that my, my video career, like, everybody kept comparing everything I did to that one piece. And because it's been collected in museums and, and people write about it, and I'm like, I was young and I'm not excusing myself. I was very calculated with, with the whole piece. Um, but I said, if you're going to compare everything I do to this, you're not allowing me as an artist to grow in a public space. You're basically saying, we want more work that's just like this. And I'm saying, that's not me. I mean, to this day, when I go back to New York, I have meetings with the same damn curators, and they say the same thing. You've compromised yourself, Angel. You have allowed society to whatever. And I'm like, really? You really? The, the media always, the authorities uh, always do that to, to artists, even in the rock music industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, remember you used to take me to that place that, where they sold cassettes of the independent yeah, like, punk uh, group, the punk bands? Right, right. Everything gets co-opted. Anything yeah. that's fringe, you look at the history of from the classics on, what doesn't get co-opted? I mean, the question becomes, as a, as, a, as a thinker, as an artist, are you working in a way where it's just to... I think you have to understand why do things get co-opted? How do they get co-opted? What happened to those of us in America who were considered marginalized artists? And when George Bush Sr. said, well, we're now embracing multiculturalism. So it affected all of us as people of color, as, as women, as whatever we are. And then we had to rethink, oh shit, we're not, we're not alternative. Yeah. Our very work that we, struggled to do got co-opted mm -hmm. within less than a year. Uh, even punk fashion. Well now it's retro. Now it's all and nobody knows their histories. Nobody knows why did the why is the clash such an important group? Not just in music global history, but also in terms of the way that they did their concerts. I mean during the um, Central America and all the civil wars that were going on in Nicaragua and El Salvador, these guys at their concerts were passing out leaflets and their videos. They were making like videos projected behind them in the 80s before everybody else thought it was cool to do that. And the, the images that were projecting were images of, of of oppression and very tastefully done, mind you. These were not images where you felt like, oh God, I can't watch this. Oh God, they're trying to beat me over the head with, with rhetoric. No, they, they did it in a very artful, tasteful way that gave another life to their music. You know, and, and that's been collected. You know, now you see like, I mean, I think groups like U2 struggle with it all the time because they came out of a very political history. And now you can't get a ticket for, what, less than $1,000 or something. Right. Listen, my brain goes all over the place. So, um, and I don't know if you're yeah, used so to that, how my, you get back right? to <laughs> my brain, I haven't changed. My Let's brain... Get back to markets and assistance.
I show Marcel the... Yeah, it's yeah, only yeah, 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I should, so, I'm not sure how much you guys know about, so, it morphed off from being a project that, that I was trying to design where a core group of artists uh, that came from mostly Baguio, um, and these were the indigenous, traditional, contemporary artists working with. Baguio has the most vibrant art scene next to New York, right? I think so. I mean, Baguio, I mean, the reason why I never really saw you was because I started spending so much of my time by 88. So I was introduced to Santiago Bosse in 88. Right. And then at that point, I started spending almost all of my time going up there. That's why Markets of Resistance is dedicated to Santi and um, Roberto Villanueva. But anyway, so the original Markets of Resistance um, was meant to include um, the Philippines, Mexico, Spain, and the U.S. And artists coming from um, indigenous and contemporary. By from these, you mean uh, the early stages? Yeah. The, the original context, the, the original concept. And it proved really difficult because also to fly six artists from the Philippines to Spain and then to Mexico, interact, and all the artists go along. So there are artists that come from each location. And every location hosts the group. And it's, you have like these interactions and, you know, and dialogues with each other. You have to have certain kinds of cultural immersions so that people can get a better sense of um, how, how is their work part of their life experiences, all this kind of stuff, right? And Markets of Resistance always had the same theme and topics. But then when I got here, Kawine and I realized that in all the grants, I had applied for three grants and I made it into final rounds, oh, I am the yeah. Yeah. but nobody could understand also the amount of money. How do you implement? Um, and I wasn't able to, I didn't have a website to show the previous project where I worked in the Visayas and um, I, I asked Brenda Fajardo to be my project manager and we worked in um, Dumaguete, Bacolod, and Bago City. And I brought in an Indonesian and Singaporean artist and I wanted to really try to showcase women. And so we worked in very grassroots levels with female artists in these areas and then students. We did workshops, we did all different kinds of community development things like listening to what their issues are, how do they, if they want to try to get access to Manila, what does that entail? How do they stay in their home towns without feeling like they have to move to Manila? You know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was really successful. And we reached a lot of people. But it couldn't have a life beyond that. Because even to document it was very difficult because I was running around managing everything. So, um, Oh, you didn't have a, a cameraman? Well, we had somebody who was um, um, who was trying to do it, but then something happened to the footage, and um, um, I shot a lot, but I can only do so much in video when I'm shooting, you know, because I was running the workshops and the overall project director. And I also had to work, you know, the Singaporean artists had never been to a country like the Philippines before, and it was extremely difficult for her. She was schooled in Japan and London, and she'd never experienced poverty like this, or even the provincial life. So most of the documentation is here in writing? Most of the documentation is actually in badly shot video. Uh, photographs and so that's why I decided I can put it up as like raw footage on a website but then there 
it's the same questions, it's the same problems. Like I did another project with um, um, Silvana Diaz's daughter and a woman named Ann Weiser, and that was in Manila. And then we did another project with Peta. But the problems that kept occurring was how do you sustain? And who has the money to be able to encourage that? Uh, this is the Philippine Education yeah. Theater. Yeah. And we did like a one day art exhibition and a really great talk because the underlying question was um, what is art for social change? And does art for social change have to be a singular form? You know, can it be. Because when you look at my work, my videos are very abstract. I mean, I consider them to be documentary, but most people do not. Because they're not done in, in a traditional method and all that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, um, there's a museum, uh, a contemporary art uh, center in Madrid called Matadero Madrid. And there are people there that I've been working with that are familiar with my work, and they love the idea of the Markets of Resistance. And that place is an old slaughterhouse. So it's perfect, absolutely perfect. But Spain has no money. <laughs> so what they were offering was a residency for six Filipino artists, but no money to fly them there, no money to like, you know, we were gonna go to Andalusia. We were, I mean, there was a whole immersion and looking at all their markets and, you know, trying to do different things. But the same thing with Mexico. I had connections to Oaxacan and Puebla uh, indigenous people. This was in, uh, what, what year was it? 2013. This is how fast this whole project has been moving. And then when I got here, it was just coincidence that I wound up taking a job at PWD. I founded this Institute for Heritage, Culture, and the Arts and produced this whole thing in, in like a year. And it's kind of why I'm really burnt out. Not always so positive. <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. Um, there was a during your lecture uh, last August, August 8th, was it? Four. Four. There was a guy who asked a question. Um, what are you resisting? And then, yeah. now, and then now, you mentioned the phrase uh, social change. Your answer was, I'm going to throw the question back to you. What does the word resistance mean to you? Why, why did you answer did that question that? that way? Because I often think, one, that questions lead to more. They're not periods, they're question marks. Two, and which is what I said to the guy, I have my own reasons for why I use the word resistance. And if you study revolution, every form of resistance requires some form of transformation into a certain way of, of living, of whether it's sustainable or not. And then a new resistance may form because, you know, aspects of communism and socialism have not worked because they're ideologies. Democracy, same thing, they're ideologies. And in democracy, as an American, we're resisting because democracy as an ideology only works for those that it works for, right? And so, on a very intellectual level and on a life experience level, my feeling has always been resistance, how do you, the question isn't, why did I turn it back to him? It's only, it's, are we talking about resistance as an individual, as a collective, and who are these people, and then how does an individual connect to a collective? So resistance can mean one thing to one person and another thing to another. Resistance for the indigenous artists that we were working with is not exactly the same thing as resistance to, you know, those of us that are in the quote-unquote contemporary art scene. We have very different things that we're fighting, that we're struggling. And so 
context is really important. It's super important. And that's why I wanted to turn the question back to him, because I don't think he wants to hear just my version of why is this called Markets of Resistance. I mean, I felt like, uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to address those questions, that very question. But at the same time, I don't want people to think that my response is the only response. It should never be. Although you, you wouldn't have any qualms about sharing your, your own faith. No, of course not. But that may change too. Right? Because even when I first started working with this, the resistance that I've met throughout as an insider and outsider is very complicated. And that's fundamentally where some of the some of the contradictions come in, right? I'm accepted for many different reasons. But of course there's the there's the question of but you can't speak these languages, you can't speak our dialects, so how is it that you actually do this? Well, with great difficulty, I have shed a lot of tears, and these tears are not out of just frustration, on, of a personal frustration. They're tears of a frustration that are so profound that they're not just mine. It's stuff that, that I am very sensitive to what other people feel, and I can't express how frustrating it is for a lot of my indigenous friends who can't verbalize the way I can. I'm, I can articulate in a certain kind of way. And they know I don't want to speak for them either. So, and they're in a quandary because they have to produce out of cement. There's no more wood. They're carving out of ice and they're being sent abroad to work on cruise ships. They're using their talents in ways. How do you resist that? It's an economic issue, right? So here I'm saying to them, and this was hard for them. On one hand, it felt like I was critiquing, criticizing the fact that they had to produce stuff for the commercial industry. But at the same time, they're not going to dance around in their G-strings in front of the botanical gardens. Um, they're not going to do that to themselves. And they're not going to make um, you know, certain wood carvings that don't show their crafts. But it's difficult for them because they can't just say, oh, our Kababayan who are doing this, that they're going to criticize them. It's not that simple. And even the very um, vendors, um, and many of them are indigenous peoples that are operating those stalls. You know how difficult it was for them once they realized what it was that we were trying to do?